Our scripture this morning comes from 1 Samuel chapter 15. And in this passage, King Saul is guilty of directly disobeying something that God asked him to do. God told him to go into this country and to, de- to destroy the enemy and everything within that borders. But instead, he allows himself to hang on to some of the sheep and cattle as spoils of war. He was directly told not to do that, but instead he disobeyed. So when Samuel, the, the prophet, approaches Saul, he hears the bleeding and mooing of the livestock. And, and that was a little bit too much to hide. It's kind of like being caught with your hand in the cookie jar, so to speak. So I want you to listen to this passage as you hear what Saul did and and listen for clues as to where he went wrong. Beginning with verse 13, it says, When Samuel came to Saul, Saul said to him, May you be blessed by the Lord. I have carried out the command of the Lord. But Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears? And the lowing of cattle that I hear. Saul says, uh, they have brought them from the Amalekites. The people spared the, uh, the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God. But the rest we've utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said to Saul, stop. I'll tell you what the Lord said to me last night. He replied, speak. Samuel said, though you are little in the eyes, in your own eyes... Though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. And the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go, utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoils and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? If I skip down to verse 24, Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now, therefore, I pray, pardon my sin and return with me so that I may worship the Lord. Now, there are times in life when we need to be brought down a notch. One of the oldest sins identified by the church is pride. And it has caused the downfall of many. In the early church, Paul talked about pride and arrogance as being a a serious problem that could undermine the church's mission, what they were trying to accomplish. And in Romans 12, 13, he says, Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. So don't think too highly of yourself, Paul says, as he addressed those puffed up, Self-righteous people, some of the, the church leaders at that time had that problem. Like that balloon, they were overinflated. And so instead, he tells them to take a good, hard look in the mirror. Look at yourself with sober judgment. Now, sober judgment, what does that mean? Well, I'd say it's the opposite of looking at the world through beer goggles. You know what beer goggles are? I'm sure you've probably heard of that. You know, under the influence of... Of alcohol, every man and every woman looks like they just stepped out of a fashion magazine, right? Because you're not seeing things as they really are. Now, that's the kind of unsober judgment that that Paul is, is condemning. Unsober judgment has led many to make regrettable decisions when they look back on their night in review the next morning. So, sober judgment then would be the exact opposite of that. Paul is saying, don't look with unsober judgment, but instead look with sober judgment and see things as they actually are. And for those who are arrogant, that means taking a real, honest, hard look in the mirror and and realizing that you're not all that. Now, that's a biblical truth that you probably heard time and time and again. After all, for a long time, it's been the message of the church that we are dirty, rotten sinners in need of Christ. Don't think too highly of yourself. You can't be good enough on your own. You need saving. However, there's another side of that coin that I want to talk to you about. A side that we don't think about nearly as much. While sober judgment means not thinking too highly of yourself, it also means not thinking too lowly of yourself either. It means not thinking too little of yourself. 
Now, from the very first chapter of the Bible, it affirms that, that humans are created in God's image. We're special. From the beginning, God declared his creation, including us, to be good. So it is just as sinful to call a precious child of God junk. Have it be our neighbor that we judge down the road or that person that we see when we first get up and look in the mirror and when we go to the bathroom in the morning. Indeed, a route to much sin and destruction today comes from thinking too little of ourselves. Low self-image, that's a real problem for people these days, for both men and women. And statistically, it does affect women the most. And it's no wonder when you think about uh, how young girls are handed a Barbie doll with impossible proportions when they're small. Children begin idolizing these, these fictitious proportions. And then on through adolescence, they idolize all these surgically altered role models found in not-so-real reality TV. They, they go to, uh, to the store, and they're in the checkout lines, and they're, they're looking at Photoshopped images in these magazines. And if you've got enough money, you can get enough plastic surgery to make all of your unnatural dreams come true. I, I saw a story the other day about a young girl who was having one plastic surgery after the other, and her goal when she got done was to resemble a doll. Now, the standards of comparison by, by which women have been subjected to, it's never been easy. I mean, even in, in the Bible, we, we see catty behavior among women. Women comparing each other. Samuel, that we hear in this scripture, Samuel's own mother, Hannah, was subjected to the taunting that she received from, uh, from fellow wife Penina. And, and that was over the fact that she hadn't had a child yet. Uh, scripture says her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. 1 Samuel 1.6. So it's not a new story, but never before had the standards that have been set by culture been so unnatural. Now, I've mentioned this before, but I'm going to tell it again. There's a trend in, uh, in Asian culture right now. For, for young girls to get oversized contact lenses, and there's a way that you can apply your eye makeup that makes your eyes look larger than life. And why? Because these, these young girls are imitating the images that they've seen in Japanese animation. That's the kind of standards that are causing girls to despise their bodies, to despise themselves the way God created them, because they're comparing themselves to a cartoon. And so now that we hear this, I think we've got some different lenses that we can go back and look at this passage and hear it differently. I think we've got the appropriate lenses to see what is taking place in this passage in Samuel. Because Saul, he was likewise guilty of thinking too little of himself. He failed to see himself the way God sees him. He failed to see in himself the potential that God saw in him when he called him to be king. And what happens when we allow our low self-image, that, that unsober judgment, when we allow it to take us over? Well, it sets us on a downward spiral. Low self-image leads to low self-esteem. And that makes us more vulnerable, more vulnerable to temptation, more susceptible to the, to the outside opi uh, opinions of others. And it's only in light of this discussion that, that one particular verse that I read really jumps out at me. In the oracle delivered by Samuel, he explains, Though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? You hear that? Though you're little in your own eyes. I bet you didn't even catch that the first time you, you read this passage. But Samuel is saying, you're thinking too little of yourself. Were you not called to be king? Would God have chosen you if he had not seen some special qualities in you? But instead, Saul, he started to second-guess himself. And as those, those insecurities, as they began to eat away at him, well, it, it opened him up, and he started listening to other voices. Now, the only opinion, the only voice that should have mattered in his self-assessment was God. But in his insecurity, he began giving ear to other voices. He began paying attention to the criticisms that people were laying upon him. The very people that he was called to serve, he began to listen to those criticisms and it began to eat away at him. Finally, rather than leading them in the way of the Lord, instead he is persuaded to follow them in their sin. 
In his own admission of sin in verse 24, uh, uh, 24 Saul hits the, the nail on the head when he says, because I feared the people and obeyed their voices. You see, you see how that happened? Because I feared the people. And the Hebrew word there that's translated feared, it's oftentimes translated uh, re- reverence or revered. So think of it this way. He gave too much reverence. He gave too much credence to what other people thought of him and not enough reverence to what God's opinion of him was. And I think that's the temptation of many leaders. Overwhelmed by criticism. It's easy to slip into that mode of trying to become a people pleaser. The only problem is you're never going to please everybody, right? And, and as soon as you satisfy today's whim then they'll just find something else to tear you down about tomorrow. A good leader must become comfortable in his or own, her own skin. A good leader must find a place to stand rather than being tossed by, by popular opinion. Otherwise, we go around like, like that balloon that I demonstrated for the kids, constantly being inflated and deflated, inflated and deflated until we're out of wind. Saul thought too little of himself. He was not not thinking of himself the way he ought to. He was guilty of not valuing himself as a child of God. And as a result, he allowed other people to prey on his vulnerability and to tempt him to sin. Now, pride and arrogance, that may be a problem for a lot of people. But having too low of an opinion of yourself can be just as destructive. Now, in your bulletin, there's a, there's a poem. You may have already looked at it and wondered, what on earth is that doing in our bulletin today? Because it sounds terrible when you first read it. I want you to pull that, that poem out of your, your bulletin right now and have it in your, in your lap. I'm going to read it to you now. And it's, it's not going to make a whole lot of sense to you until I come back to it later at the end of my sermon. So I want you to follow along as I read this. It, it, this poem, it paints a, a powerful image of, of what, many, what many young people think of themselves when they look in the mirror and when they go throughout their day worrying about what other people think, valuing themselves on the basis of others' judgments. But this poem, when I get done with this sermon, you're going to see the power of transformation. You're going to see the power of transformation that can take place when you simply change your focus from thinking about what other people think to looking up and thinking about what God thinks of us. So follow along with this poem entitled, Pretty Ugly. I'm very ugly. I don't, uh, so don't try to convince me that I'm a very beautiful person because at the end of the day, I hate myself in every single way. And I'm not going to lie to myself by saying there is beauty inside of me that matters. So rest assured, I will remind myself that I am a worthless, terrible person. And nothing you say will make me believe I still deserve love because no matter what, I am not good enough to be loved. And I am in no position to believe that beauty does exist within me. Because whenever I look in the mirror, I always think, am I as ugly as people say? When Eve sinned in the garden and took a bite of that forbidden fruit, it was because rather than listening to God's voice, she listened to the serpent's lie. You're not good enough, the serpent taunted. You're incomplete the way you are. Here, have some of this. It won't hurt you. It's going to open your eyes and make you like God. If the devil can convince you that you're not good enough the way God made you, then he's just opened up uh, an avenue, created an opening to tempt you to sin. It was true for Eve. It was true for Saul. And it's true for so many people today. Because the moment you buy into this lie, you will do anything to relieve yourself of the pain and anxiety that is caused by those feelings of of inferiority. You'll do anything. You'll try anything. You'll change anything. You'll become anyone. And in doing so, you hand the keys to your soul over to whoever is willing to take them. And that would be like tossing your car keys to a total stranger. Would you do that? Just see somebody down the street, here here are the keys to my car. And then when they start driving that car, why do you act surprised when they don't drive it the way you would? You think they're going to go easy on the accelerator? You don't think they're going to slam the door every time they get out? They're not going to take care of that car. 
Well, that's what happens when we give someone else the keys to our soul. It, it, it puts you in danger. It puts you in danger of sin. It puts you in danger of, of, of damage and destruction and abuse. Like Saul, we need to repent. We need to admit that we have sinned. And why? Because we have feared other people. We have given credence to what they had to say, more so than we've given credence to what God thinks of us. We worried more about their opinion of us than God's opinion. We obeyed their voice instead. May we repent. May we repent and ask God to speak to our hearts and minds once again. May God's Spirit fill us up and tie off that balloon so that God's voice is the one inside of us. And, and that's, that's how we go through life. May God's voice be the primary standard by which we measure ourselves. In Amos 7, the prophet had a vision, a vision of a plumb line. Do you know what a plumb line is? It's basically a weight on a string. I see Bernice nodding. I bet he's got one. I should have borrowed one from you. He's got one out in his toolbox right now. It's been used for, for thousands of years. And uh, in this vision, Amos uh, has a vision of a plumb line, and in verses 1, 1 through 8 of chapter 7, it says, This is what he showed me. The Lord was standing by a wall that he had built true to plumb, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord asked me, What do you see, Amos? A plumb line, I replied. Then the Lord said, Look, I'm setting a plumb line among my people Israel. What a powerful image of how we should view ourselves and, and determine how we measure up. Because, see, the thing about a plumb line is you can't use a plumb line horizontally. You know, if I wanted to see if this table was level and I went over here and I tied a string here and, and I had the weight here and let go, what's going to happen? It's just going to hit the floor. It's not going to show me anything. You can't tie a plumb line to something and use it horizontally. It only works if it's tied from above. So you can't use a plumb line by tying it to your neighbor's house. You can't use a plumb line by running it further down the street. That's not going to give you an accurate measurement. But that's precisely what you are doing when you measure yourselves according to the opinions of these horizontal relationships that we have. Our family, our friends, our co-workers, the strangers that we encounter, the images that we see on TV, these are all horizontal. If you're going to try to build a house on the basis of these measurements, well, you're going to have trouble. And, and, and things are never going to be straight. A plumb line only works if it's tied from above. And the only way that we can break free of our low self-image is to attach that plumb line from above and turn to God and God's opinion of you. And what does God think of you? One of the best poetic expressions in Scripture of what God thinks of us comes from Psalm 139. It says, God knows us even better than we know ourselves. Listen to what it says here. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it. And then... Starting with verse 13, it says, For you created my inmost being. You hear that? God knows us from the inside out. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am wonderfully made, fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I the, to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. And when I awake, I am still with you. God knows us. God knows us better than anybody. God knows us better than our best friend. God knows us better than even our spouse. God knows us better than we know ourselves sometimes. And yet, God chooses to love us anyway. When God looks at you, God sees a beautiful child of God. Created for His purposes. Destined to be with Him for all of eternity. You are beautiful. When I awake, I'm still with you. 
God is still with us in the morning. God didn't slip out in the middle of the night. He's with us there in the morning. He's with us, morning breath and all, when our feet first hit the floor. And he's still whispering in our ear, lest we forget. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are the work of my hands. God is that heavenly beam by which we are supposed to tie that plumb line. For it's only when we look up, when we measure ourselves from above, that we can see ourselves accurately for who we are. And with that in mind, I want to demonstrate to you a powerful transformation. A powerful transformation that can take place when we simply change our perspective and look up. When we reverse our perspective from looking down at the ground and feeling sorry for ourselves to looking up at God and measuring ourselves according to God's plumb line and how God sees us. That poem that that I shared with you earlier, get that back out. You've got to follow along and see this with your own eyes. I want you to read along with me as I recite this poem one more time. Only this time, instead of reading it from the top down, I'm going to reverse my perspective. And I'm going to read it line by line from the bottom up so that we turn our perspective to the heavens. Am I as ugly as people say? Because whenever I look in the mirror, I always think beauty does exist within me. And I am in no position to believe that I'm not good enough to be loved. Because no matter what, I still deserve love. And nothing you say will make me believe that I am a worthless, terrible person. So rest assured, I will remind myself, there is beauty inside of me that matters. And I'm not going to lie to myself by saying I hate myself in every single way. Because at the end of the day, I am a very beautiful person. So don't try to convince me that I'm very ugly. Let us pray. Lord God, it's amazing through this this poetic exercise that we can see sometimes the answer is staring us right in in, in our very face. We can feel so bad about ourselves. We can assess the facts about ourselves and our circumstances and feel depressed about it. Or we can look up and we can interpret them entirely differently. It begins by deciding where we're going to tie that plumb line. Are we going to tie it to the criticism, to our friends, our family, our coworkers, those voices on on the media and the TV, those voices that would breathe negativity into our life? Is that where we're going to tie our plumb line or are we going to tie it to you? When we tie it to you, we see two things. We see that the only thing that matters is your opinion of us. We'll see that it's not okay when we sin and fall short of your glory. But we also see that you promise never to leave us nor forsake us. That you love us just the way we are. That you help us get where we need to be. That it was while we were crooked, while we were crumbling, while we were still sinners that Christ died for us higher plumb line to you Lord we hear that still small voice whispering in our ear we realize that we are indeed fearfully wonderfully made Lord God forgive us for those times when we have failed to recognize that forgive us for those times when we've turned to other sources for our value and purpose in life restore in us the joy of our salvation as we turn to you And as we get our identity through our baptism and our relationship with you through Jesus Christ. It is because of the price Jesus Christ paid to put us into a right relationship with you. It is because of that great sacrifice that we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.